uh, as being the, the mechan basically just being an identity mechanism. Um, yeah, let's follow up after this because I think that would go, that would also address some of the questions regarding the higher level claims as well and how you represent those and where they get stored. Okay, thanks. Okay, and for the queue, do you want to answer questions now or do you want to wait until the end? We should probably let Eric say his his piece. Uh, it's Lawrence Lindblad that has the question. Uh, is it Lawrence? Can we can we make sure that um, Eric? I'm done. I, I answer. I, I asked my question. Okay. Okay. So let's let's switch back to Eric and try and finish, and then if there's time, I'm glad to discuss anything further. All right. Thank you, Guy, and thanks for the questions. Basically, one of the hard problems that we're trying to figure out is how uh, draft Fedorka fits into the other drafts that are out there. And we thought about this for a while because we have an adopted language draft. We have a Yang model for TPM uh, that Hank is going to be talking about later. And there are questions about how, and we also have, I should put on here, the use case uh, draft as well. And the question of how come we need another draft came up. What this slide tries to do is identify what is in draft Fedorka that we feel is essential information for an operator, which wasn't sufficiently captured in the other drafts that I just mentioned. Obviously, there is a use case listed in the use case uh, document that Michael stewards, but there's a number of things about RIV which is not well uh, and sufficiently documented in the use case. For example, what are the prerequisites and simplifying assumptions of working with TPMs? How do you and what keys exist in a network environment that we have to have pre established? What kind of information might already be set up in the um, a tester or the relying party? Uh, as well as the call flow and how different types of in information or evidence might be acquired. All this is legitimate information which bounds the profile for the rest of the network to operate. Now, with these contexts established, we can go ahead and use the Yang model and expect it to operate. So we've defined the operational prerequisites for the Yang model as part of the profile identified here. Uh, additionally, with this baseline profile, there's potential improvements in other drafts, such as the trusted path routing one that I submitted, as well as something uh, draft Ixia that uh, Wei Pan suggested uh, uh, and has been discussing previously as well. And so we were able to break that down into the language document, which is being developed across RATS, which defines the context for this profile, and then the interface specifications are built from there. Now, independent of this, uh, you know, Weipan and I and, and others have been discussing how to streamline the future stuff, but I think at this point it is essential to go ahead and identify for this use case the operational prerequisites. And this is how we feel this draft relates to the others that are in the discussion. Right, next slide. Now, if you assume that we need such a profile document, the question then comes, where do we include this in our document path? How do we handle current TPM-based router switch operational prerequisites? <coughs> Excuse me. And we see two different possible answers here. The first one would be that we'd have a separate um, actually, I, this is a slightly older version, so I apologize. It should say on the left-hand side, separate drafts for the profile and for the Yang model uh, instead of option one. And the pros of that are really that you have separate uh, reading and separate documents um, with the downside uh, of being, you know, have mobile working group documents per use case. And the other option is to include the information in RIV within uh, draft Chara and has the pro of future a fewer working group drafts, but a number of downsides, such as a large document, um, the problem of binding this profile to a Yang model, parts of which might be obsoleted, 
as well as le less modularity. I know that there are other people out there that want to build additional things off this profile that might not require the yang. So our, our question of the working group is, you know, what is a better way to capture the requirements? Is it better to have a separate profile in Yang, or is it better to have them all together? And, uh, and that's really the main question we want to leave with the working group as part of this. If there are strong opinions one way or another, we would then uh, try to go ahead and uh, propose working group adoption of the requirements into one of these two options. We have Yuri in the queue. Yuri, you have a question? You might be on another mute. No, no, I got it. I got it. I got it. Sorry. Uh, uh, hopefully you can hear me. When I see routers, I assume that occur that applies to wireless routers and, and, you know, just from looking at my employer and from our products. Um, we would prefer to support an ETH model for the same use case. And everything that's listed in this document are things that are believe are testable, even if they're not in exactly the TTM format. Um, I think we, if we were to try to be, uh, if we were try to, to try to be compliant from a from a wireless router perspective, then we would have to essentially put forward something like a firmware TPM, and that's not going to provide the same, I don't believe it provides the same level of assurances as what's being intended in this document. So um, my question is to the authors, why can't you augment this document with an e-profile that's suitable for routers and make it applicable to, applicable to, <laughs> to some of the company's uh, products? So. <laughs> That is a okay, perfect leading question. <laughs> uh, Eric and I discussed whether we could get it into this draft or not, and <clears throat> we're not we weren't there in time. But uh, I I think that uh, EEP is a likely candidate to go into this into this document as well. Um, that's that's one of the reasons that at least uh, you know I, at least I would prefer to not uh, merge this document into into the Chara document, because I think uh, Yang is one way to to convey this information, but uh, EEP is the second one, is the next one down on my list. Does that help? I, I definitely agree with that. Okay, so I think the next in queue is Dave, but not on this slide. So I don't know if somebody wants to follow on from the current or if Dave Although Guy just followed us with a Taiwan comment into the slide. And so, <laughs> um, so I was originally going to ask a question I'm going to ask now, but you've, uh, I think I can guess at your answer. Uh, so first I want to say thank you for updating the title because um, that was one of my comments before. So thank you for addressing previous feedback, right? The title of the document now reads and same on your slide deck, TPM based network device remote integrity verification, right? And which does match the content of the document. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, I was going to, when I got into the queue, I was going to ask a terminology question that uh, I think I now have an opinion on the answer. Uh, the answer. Um, but I was going to ask, because you keep using the term RIV, um, and so my terminology question was going to be, do you consider the term RIV to be inherently specific to TPMs, or would you use the term RIV if you had network devices that were not TPM-based? And this is what Ian and uh, uh, Gary were just talking about, too, I think. And so a definitional, do you think RIV should be narrow term specific to TPM, or do you think it should be agnostic to what your root of trust is? Um, we could go through some of what I think are the key requirements. I, this might take a little while to prepare, but... <clears throat> uh, I'm only asking a terminology question. What is your guess as to the intent of the term? <laughs> uh, it, well, in this context, the way the document is written, obviously, it's TPM because I'm yeah. Yeah. trying to avoid having to uh, completely generalize it. Um, but right. if we have a network device or somebody creates a network device, right, that doesn't use a TPM, it uses, say, you know, a TEE and is still DICE compliant according to TCG spec, right? But it's not TPM, so it's not going to do this. Would you say they would need to use a term other than RIV for their network device attestation? Or 
Oh, I, I would, in that context, I would like to be inclusive and have them help to generalize the thing. Okay. Uh, that was my hope based on your answer before. And so for that, uh, I think the way I agree with your comment uh, in response to Gary, which was, I think that motivates for your option one um, for some of the same reasons, right? To not ah, I see I, Yes. Right. Yes. I, I think that's, that's. So you actually have answered my question, but I just want an explicit terminology point about should rib the term be specific to TPM or should, because right now the document is about TPM based network device, rib, right? And so, uh, if you were to do non TPM based RIV, you could still use uh, the term RIV in your other document with your new title, right? But I don't know if that was the intent. So thank you. I think you've answered my question. Yeah, that's good. Thank you for pointing that out. Thank you, Susie. And again, um, so slight variation on that last question. What, what makes this router specific versus any device specific? Uh, yeah, it's the answer is is quite similar. Um, Yang, <laughs> to be specific. <laughs> um, so if we, you know, a, a way of looking at the RIV document is that we have specified one root of trust that is the TPM and one uh, one interface mechanism which is mediated by Yang. Um, neither of those are fundamental to the uh, goal of uh, testing the software base on a device. So, um, if I were to include uh, industrial, uh, you know, industrial IoT equipment, um, I think it would be basically the same document, except that instead of Yang, it would use some other protocol that was more familiar to industrial IoT guys. Um, throw one other possibility in there too. Um, one of the things that the, a number of router vendors do is they include a secure uh, key pre provision as part of the process that uniquely identifies that device. Um, that's not always true with PCs and others that where you don't uniquely identify a device in the manufacturing process. So there are some simplifying assumptions you can make based on that pre provision key type. Now, in this document, there are some definitions of the key types, and I wouldn't disqualify right now that the ease of provisioning or maintain the key types could be made easier based on the secure identity of a device uh, embedded as part of manufacturing. Yes. So as I was, going to, I was just going to bring that up because here you are venturing into the provisioning process, which might go quite deeply into the whole supply chain. I don't know whether you actually want to go down that route. I think uh, looking at this now with the answer that it's router specific because it's because there's Yang. Um, I think if you make that use case clear, uh, I think this is fine. Yeah, I, I, don't think that, um, I don't think we're actually defining the provisioning process. What we're defining is the result of the provisioning process. For example, the provisioning process results in these keys existing. So we're not saying how to provision it, but we can suggest after it's provisioned, this is the uh, information. Is, is, is that then specific to the use case that this document is targeting? Uh, for, for, if I might, for routers, uh, one of the applications is so-called zero touch provisioning. And um, it is a lot easier to see how to get zero touch provisioning to work if the device ships from the factory with uh, with identity already programmed into it. Um, so that is, um, let's say an assumption perhaps, uh, uh, well, which is I think explicitly embedded in the, in the RIV proposal as a stance. I, again, that's not necessarily fundamental, but <clears throat> uh, uh, making RIV work in a privacy sensitive application like a PC would require you know, different stuff, right? It would be worse. It would be harder than simply swapping out Yang uh, if you want to use this stuff in a, in a privacy preserving setting. Uh, TPMs obviously can be and are used in that, in that configuration. But as you said, the provisioning mechanism 
after the thing is shipped gets a little more complicated. Does that help? I, I, I'm, I'm, on the I'm quite happy with that, yep. Thanks. Just, just a comment, it, yeah, I wouldn't call that zero touch. Uh, when someone pre-provisioned a key, someone provisioned a key, so there was a touch. Um, and it just happened that <laughs> you, you're, you're, it, from your per particular perspective, it was zero touch, but someone else had to do some serious work. And oh. well, yeah, but I think it's considered for game for the manufacturer to touch the thing, even if it's a zero touch product. Oh, that, is that is that the definition of touch? Is the manufacturer gets to touch, but the others don't? I mean, I mean, <laughs> it's, not, it's not that we're preventing anyone from touching. We're trying to. Uh, avoid requiring them to touch. So the, the point, the, the simple idea, forgive me, behind RIV is that we can manufacture a box, uh, drop ship it to a customer, and they can open the box and plug the cable into the wall, and the rest of it just happens. Right? And I think one of the things that has caused uh, a lot of trouble in getting TPM systems to work is in privacy sensitive applications that's not okay because it wakes up and immediately tells its master who it is and where it is and all kinds of stuff um, in router land that is perfectly acceptable uh, and in fact required but in pc land that is not um, so there's in in pc land there has to be a provisioning step which is handled after manufacturing and before you can actually use the device and that to me does not represent zero touch um yeah okay okay uh, guys we, uh, we need enough. to move I saw, on yeah, i saw my question too. thanks okay we we are out of time yep we need to move on okay thank you yeah, Kathleen, I, I guess at some point we didn't have time to, to ask the question, so. Yeah, so how do we move forward on asking the question as to where we go next with this? Um, okay, I'm just trying to stay respectful of the time. Um, Ned, you stopped sharing. Um, so I think the first question is, there's currently a draft, I'll call it the RIV draft because I don't remember the whole title. Um, and so the question is, do we believe that um, when I took a look at the updates, it's more than just a use case, it shows a profile for how you would use the TPMs um, to do the remote attestation, and it is still TM specific. Um, but the question is, do we believe that this is a useful draft or the content is useful? That's the first question. The second question is, if we believe that that is the case, then should that be incorporated into um, the options that you listed? Keep it in, keeping it as a separate uh, draft or incorporating um, that flow into the Chara draft. Is that fair? I think so, Eric. Yes, that's the question. We're hoping for content adoption both work, and we seem to have people leaning towards option one from the call. Well, okay. So, do you want me to ask the question for just? Well, okay. Sorry, I'm trying to go in and out because I'm supposed to be in another meeting. Um, okay. So the question is, do people on the call believe? that this content is useful and needed in RATS. Um, okay, how do I do this? Um, Maybe ask in the negative, does anyone think that it is not useful in RATS and have them speak up? Roman. <laughs> so I'm just gonna give you- can always ask for a show of hands, but- No, 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 I was like, do I do this in the chat? Okay, does anybody object to having this content be brought into rats. Speak now. Going once, going twice. Okay. So. 
I mean, um, some... Danielle speaking. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I think the content is um is is pretty good for rats. And um, I like the the option to extend that to teep. To teep. To teep. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, so we can ask Guy, the authors of the draft, to take it into TEEP as well. Um, but my question, given that we're, we're out of time, given that we have, um, and we'll confirm this over the, the mail list as well. Okay, so given that we have that, um, are there objections to have this draft be adopted as a working group draft? If there are any objections, speak now. The clarifying question. This is Dave. Um, yes. Is the intent of because usually an adoption is a uh, like a promise to publish. Is the intent that the eventual work would be TPM specific, or as was discussed during the call, that the eventual work would not be TPM specific? And so when we say adopting this draft, which scope do we think is this draft? So I don't have an objection. I just want to know what it is that we're agreeing on. Okay. So I'm seeing this draft as being TPM specific, but perhaps we should pose this okay. question to the authors, right? So let me let me ask the authors real. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, with an answer. Yes, TPM specific. Okay. So there you go. So it's a TPM specific profile draft. Okay. So I have no objection as long as the working group would is not rule out the opportunity of having a draft that is not TPM specific should somebody want to write one, since I know that there was people like Ian and that spoke up earlier in a call. So nope, and that is fair if they wanted to bring that in. Okay. So going once, going twice. All right. So you guys have um your direction. I will confirm this on the email. And um if there are no objections, then um to the authors, I'll create a repo in the GitHub. Yes. So, so Nancy, I see Daniel jumping in. I'm not sure whether he's objecting. In the WebEx chat. Daniel, you're on the chat. You're on the queue, sorry. Daniel Miguel. We heard from Daniel a moment ago. Is Can this you hear me? But, but he, yes. yes. Okay, so I'm not objecting at all. Okay. Um, but I'm, um, um, even if it's only TPM, but if there is a, uh, a tip specific thing, I would be happy to contribute to that. Okay. So uh, my suggestion is for you to reach out to the authors sure. yeah. to do that. All right. So I let you guys run over by 15 minutes. So that means Hank, you have to stay on time. Sorry. <laughs> I was giving everybody an extra five minutes. But yeah, well, thank, um, you. thank you, Nancy. Okay. Um, Hank? I am uh, not on mute. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Excellent. Um, I have to highlight that I cannot always hear everyone here. Uh, Ian, I'm very sorry. Everything you said, I have to read for you from the notes. So if you are raising a question or someone else, I actually have no audio reception from. I will have to look into the notes. Just a heads up, uh, there might be a small delay sometimes. Questions, if there are any, if there are any. This is, of course, all self explaining. And uh, so I have a, a little uh, set of drafts here, um, slides here for uh, some of the drafts in the data tracker associated with rats. And um, I'd like to start with a draft that is called Reference Interaction Model, that is an outdated file name. Um, Effectively, it's the interaction model for challenge response based remote attestation. That is what the backroom Chara is for. This is not the Yang module draft. Next slide, please. Like only slide, please. Um, and we are considering, no, actually, two slides. Uh, we are considering aggregating the interaction models in this draft. At the moment, of course, there's Chara in there. Chara, basically, uh, just to give an example, as speaking of in general, there are other ways to do this, but in general, the challenge response, the challenger is the verifier. Uh, 
uh, using a nonce and uh, the respondent is the uh, tester. Uh, we follow uh, this ID with the BCP205, it's relatively new. Uh, that is the implementation status BCP because there is a proof of concept implementation here. Uh, I can go into a little bit of detail because uh, recently we uh, adopted uh, Lawrence's Seabor uh, and Cozy code, uh, namely QCBOR and T underscore Cozy in this uh, software project here. I'm switching from uh, tiny Seabor. So it's a, it's a very straightforward implementation using CoApp and Seabor uh, payload. And uh, it is literally doing Chara. So the verifier can query a, a tester for evidence. Evidence is generated based on the nonce and so on. And uh, this is uh, available in the highlighted URI. And we track this implementation as one of these. Uh, we have other uh, implementations. Apparently, uh, Yang Chara is based on this Chara interaction model. So we have running code in network equipment today. Uh, not sometimes not the whole Yang module, but uh, uh, parts of it. So we have uh, uh, running code on two places already, and that is why we have the interaction model in a separate uh, draft because uh, there is only one feasible way to do challenge response. There is a minimal set of information um, information elements required to do it. Uh, most prominently the nonce. That's why I'm highlighting it so often here, and um, but other things like uh, identities. And um, so in, in order to not uh, do text cloning here and with every solution draft that uses the Chara interaction model, we would, uh, I think, prefer to have that in a standalone draft. But we are under the uh, guidance to not to create too many informational drafts. This apparently it would be an informational draft. And therefore, I'm, I'm posing the question later where to put this actually. But there are, uh, to elaborate on this, other action models. The uh, second one is the uh, Tudor one. Uh, you are not using nonces here. You are uh, effectively using two types of uh, information groups. One of them is a sync token, which binds global time to a relative time of a, uh, um, a testing environment. And then you lose a lot of timestamps correspondingly. So uh, this uh, can prove past states. So you have a evidence that is not conveyed immediately. If you convey it uh, uh, two months later, uh, you just can push it. There's no, still be no solicitation here, and it's still valid evidence without a nonce. Uh, to achieve that, you have a price. Uh, this price is you have to somehow uh, get a time synchronization trustworthy in your uh, security domain. And this can be done by a global source of time, the TSA. As an internet draft for that, um, that creates the TSP, the timestamp protocol. Plus, that is timestamp to be valid. Um, but in any case, uh, so that is a second interaction model. This is basically only firing in one direction. You can realize network diodes with it. There's literally no uh, feedback required. You can just uh, emit single uh, unidirectional message streams here. And then we have a hybrid of these two, so to speak. Uh, that is the subscription. Uh, the subscription uh, simplifies uh, uh, the starting point of having this unicast thingy uh, because it can use the handshake for a session setup on the subscription state. For example, via attestation event streams as uh, highlighted or the PubSub model as highlighted. And um, so, uh, and then and go on with the time stamped uh, telemetry, uh, like uh, in this case. Uh, so some in some cases, this is basically a hybrid of the two and therefore a additional interaction model. All these uh, could be generalized via technology agnostic and then uh, in a single draft. Typically, and now next slide, please. Typically, this is an architectural component. Uh, it goes back to back with roles in an architectural model normally. Um, but the architecture should be crisp, concise, and uh, method to factor not too complicated to read. So that would speak against that a little bit. Um, we have also uh, a generic information model for these uh, three interaction models included. And um, 
Therefore, it is more than that. And if you stuff everything into the architecture or other documents, it might get a little uh, crowded there at some point. Um, and yes, uh, code cloning is a thing. So uh, text cloning is a thing. And we don't want to have uh, multiple ways to do the same thing and written it in different places. Always, It always causes confusion and has some little uh, differences in it and therefore inconsistency. So uh, options are to have a standalone document for each model, which I think is overkill. That's why we were thinking about option two to bundle all the interaction models into a single document. That would be like, I, from the top of also my, my gut feeling would be like 25 to 30 pages then. And uh, we could uh, merge into the architecture, adding this number to the architecture, or as an alternative, we could uh, select a well, first come first soft solution draft and put the interaction model there. Uh, Yang Chara, for example, is the first draft using Chara. And we could uh, put the content of the interaction model there, and every other solution has to refer to this solution. All of these options, I think, are somehow viable. Personally, of course, I prefer option two, but maybe this list is not even complete or should be completely different. So this is my question. First question is uh, the comments on this options or other comments on the uh, presentation I just gave. Okay, you have to um, Yeah, so I think you're asking the right question here, Hank. Um, I think I might break it into uh, two separate questions only because uh, I might choose a different option for the two different questions, depending. Uh, or I might, I don't know if I would. Um, so I think part of the question is, uh, where do interaction models go? And I think the answer is it depends on what the interaction model level of detail is. So, for example, when we say the term model, do we mean something that's normative or something that's informative? And do we mean something that is uh, very concrete? And by concrete, I would give an example of the appendices in the TUDA uh, document, right, are concrete as opposed to uh, models, which uh, somebody that has a different implementation than the different appendices in TUDA would have still apply to the model. And so I would uh, ask the question is, where should general discussion of models go? And then where should be the specific stuff uh, go? So for like the th stuff that's in the appendices in the TUDA, I would think option four would might be the best thing for that kind of information. For the general stuff, I think the other options are still valid, and I don't yet have a strong opinion between them, and I'm going to listen to other people's uh, comments. So I see there's two people in the queue behind me, so we'll see Lawrence. Yeah, my question is, um, uh, I'm not super familiar with the draft yet, but, but like, well, how would this cover um, interaction with uh, Android attestation or um, things that are kind of more EAT-based and even even some of the FIDO stuff. I mean, I, I'm not sure how that fits in here, but I think it if it is a something that is defining rats uh, interaction model, the rats interaction model or something like that, then it needs to cover all of those things. If it's just specific to one solution, then it's then that that's okay. Then it's specific to a solution. So the intent is that it is absolutely not. Not uh, specific to the solution, sorry. And uh, I was going to say agnostic. Oh, no, it is agnostic. Uh, that is the absolute goal. Even the text today uh, uses terms like claims and, and, uh, and, and just like identities, not, not uh, enforcing encodings or source of these. Just there, there are some ground rules. So my question back would be, or my, my recommendation back would be, there's a chart in there, like a diagram that says, shows the sequence of the interaction model. If you're... Uh, if the file attestation use case does not work into that, because you are, for example, do not have a certain information element required in one of the interactions, then speak up. We can uh, try to mold it and massage it so it works for all, or we have to split it even and say that is actually a different model. Yeah. Okay. It would be very interesting because that is very important for people to understand. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Michael, you're in the queue. Um, so I guess I was confused a little bit by the inclusion of Chara because I guess I thought that was a specific protocol with a specific implementation. Um, so um, I don't think you're aiming to describe specific protocols or or maybe I don't understand um, what level of 
call it standardization you're asking the question about? Um, we are not aiming to uh, specify protocol here, most certainly, um, but protocols interact in a certain manner. And again, the challenge response thing is, I hope, very easy to grasp. Uh, challenger provides nonce. Freshness uh, uh, is proven by including that nonce in a cryptographic action and giving back uh, a response in time. So you can see that this response is based on your nonce. Very easy. So this is apparently not protocol specific. It is specific to some protocols that will use this model. And would require some other uh, further frosting and information elements to facilitate it. So that is my answer. I hope it suffices. Uh, Chara uh, is just uh, is an implementation is tracked here to show that this interaction model works and it provides uh, creates a, a, a useful output. Uh, but this 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 implementation is of course a proof of concept implementation and specific therefore uh, and just to show that the model has validity. You cannot show a model validity with formal model checking here, but it's a handshake. So how complex is that? So we show in practice that it works. That is the only So I guess an to answer right answer the questions on the screen, I think that one is dumb. Don't do that. Um, uh, two or three, are, uh, uh, number two, standalone or merged into the architecture ID are both good ideas, and I'm not quite sure uh, which is better. Um, uh, number four was, is what we would do if someone comes along with an interaction model um, that uh, we hadn't thought of yet and then comes along with a new thing. So it could be that that's the right option to go with in the end. Um, um, and and, and it, maybe we should just do that. Uh, and uh, once we have, once we, appear to have a few uh, solutions that have the same interaction model, then we could consider whether that needs to, uh, we need to, to refactor that in a future documents. Yeah, that's okay. good. Uh, yes, it, it, Ned is next. Okay, sorry. Yeah, and, then, so, uh, and, and Ned is last on the queue, so. So, so the architecture, uh, uh, tries to define a set of roles and 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 a role, an architecture for those roles, and and it goes it goes to the pool. Uh, tries to make a point of <clears throat> saying that the that the roles are the, that the deployments can differ uh, broadly, but the the canonical roles and relationships are preserved. And my question is: Is that the does that sort of logic apply to interaction models <clears throat> in that they're sort of uh, meta models uh, or or exemplary type uh, expressions that still have to go through a layer of adaptation in order to to use to, to apply them in in sort of a real world deployment or implementation. Um, that's very, a very good point. Uh, actually, today the interaction models we are focusing on are conveyance of evidence. Uh, same as be true for attestation results. How do you get the attestation result? Is it streamed to you, do you directionally with subscriptions, or do you do you do you query them with challenge response? Same thing, basically. That would not be covered today, and it is a very good issue to raise. And I think yes, they should be generalized in a way that they are uh, basically maybe the endorser role is a small exception there, um, but basically interaction between all of the roles and not only the the uh, the standard example we go to here right now that is verify a tester. Yeah. Good point. Okay, you guys, we need to move on. Um, is Kathleen back on? Yes, I've just been back on for a couple of minutes. Okay, thanks, because I should get going. Okay, oh, so. Yes, sorry, um, thank you. Hank is going to continue now to talk about Chara, I think. Now comes the Yang module. So I, uh, and uh, as, a, as a last option to the last uh, end by Nancy, um, I will post, uh, repost this question to the list, of course. Um, I assume, I hope Dave and uh, Ned you will reiterate your uh, replies here uh, in the list again. Then we have this uh, conversation captured and uh, accessible to most. Um, having said that, now the Yang module apparently uh, uses Chara. So, uh, uh, first slide, please. 
uh, about network equipment devices uh, for close to the to the rev uh, profile. Um, and uh, I was bringing up the where does stuff go because uh, the uh, um, Riv presentation basically covered the same problem. So that was why I put in this back to back uh, background already actually was covered by uh, by uh, Guy quite well. Uh, and it's yeah, Yang and network equipment goes hand in hand. That's that's typically why this is a network equipment scope. It is not uh, exclusively so you can run a Yang server on your cell phone if you want. So uh, typically you cannot find them there. That is the problem, so to speak. That is why the scope is limited by uh, use of Yang to mostly, I would say, network equipment. Um, we uh, have also the advantage to use existing stuff. That's good. Also, the Yang is uh, use of Yang management interface is uh, recommended in the IETF if it's possible. It's uh, adding to the ecosystem, so to speak. Um, and uh, Yang has all the tools uh, included, like the RPC statements can be used there. These are basically the main uh, main construct that is uh, enabling Java. And uh, we have uh, um, also been used, so to speak, already by uh, the trusted power routing draft that uh, extends and, and, and consecutively by PubSub uh, that, is, um, that is using the uh, telemetry uh, via subscription to uh, the tree that we provide here in uh, the Chara module. Next slide, please. So, oh no, this is the next, next slide. No, no, actually it's the next, sorry. Um, yeah, so um, we are missing some English text still, the Yang module on the other hand, matures quite well, and there's basically no of this so-called churn anymore. Um, we are also uh, are successfully are being adopted for for other interaction models that are based on this uh, Chara. That is actually very excellent. Um, so now we will wait uh, until the architecture terminology is uh, also stable, which is, I think, uh, a very near-term goal, and then uh, create some um, usage text what uh, the explicit RPCs are for, what the intent is, refer to the interaction model, what part of the interaction model information elements are specialized here, and so on and so on. And uh, there are some decision uh, basically uh, have to be done before that, like the interaction model, how, how, what scope, where and why, even with RIF, uh, what is the uh, terminology and generalization happening there. And if this is um, done, we basically align. So we can have a, a coherent set of drafts that is really, really uh, interconnecting and not confusing to the reader. I hope we will structure them well, and therefore uh, this is basically the uh, open issue. Um, the Yang module itself has been uh, actually implemented and uh, is uh, proving to be viable, and uh, therefore uh, we assume that without a uh, um, proof of uh, the um, counter, basically, we uh, uh, will have, uh, assume that you can go to working group last call having added that English text. Um, are there comments on this doubts or recommendation or queue? I, I don't see the queue right now. No. Nobody on the queue. Okay. I, so, I think we, we've had fairly good luck so far with the uh, Yang model as it, as it stands. Yeah, uh, literally a lot of prominent uh, um, equipment vendors or interested parties are contributing all the time to, to have been contributing for a long time to this. And uh, thank you to all of them. And uh, uh, yeah, this is, I think, why we're good. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Guy. Um, yeah, then uh, if there's nothing uh, to be um, said about this anymore, we can move to the next one. Uh, in the spirit of Elliot, uh, this slide is titled is Muddy Rats. Um, because um, Elliot's MUT uh, RFC is the basis for this work. First slide, please. This draft basically is about um, the, um, the uh, um, enablement or the enabling of uh, discovering of all the resources a uh, red's role is depending on. Um, and we were. Uh, mind brainstorming here um, how to, to facilitate that with things that are already there. And uh, MUT um, RFC effectively uh, provides an interesting method here, a MUT URL 
I'm typing URI because I, I I was following the draft for so long that I think sometimes it's a URI, but typically it's called a MAT URL. I'm sorry, this is a little bit of a misnomer here. So the MAT URL can be uh, that is pointing to the directive that is the MAT file uh, can be included in a dev ID, which is very convenient. It is standardized or specified in the uh, in the RFC. And um, we want to make use of that because a lot of network equipment devices, for example, uh, going with that, but also a lot of other things, including cell phones, uh, often have uh, dev IDs. And if you can include in a dev ID, and actually I think uh, Matt uh, is talking about X509 documents, so it could be a certificate uh, also, a public certificate. Um, you can present your dev ID to a, um, for example, manager of the system or verifier and uh, have then a uh, certification path to a trust anchor that goes with this dev ID. And if you trust that trust anchor, as you probably could if it's from a network vendor that you know, um, then uh, the MAT file that is uh, also provided by the uh, same endorser here uh, can have a list of things in it, or multiple lists actually, uh, that are interesting to rats. First of all, we were looking at the endorsement documents um, that are created by the endorser and the Reds architecture, apparently. Um, basically, these are signed claim sets that provide uh, um, characteristics that are trustworthy about the things an attester cannot create evidence about. And uh, that's a very long sentence to say root of trust. Um, effectively, roots of trust uh, cannot create evidence about themselves, so they have to be endorsed from the outside. That's a very common use case. Uh, and uh, so uh, in order to do that, uh, you have to find the source of these endorsements. Sometimes they are included literally in the root of trust themselves, but sometimes they are not. And therefore you need a pointer. And this uh, would, this uh, MAT URL would point to a MAT file in which you can find a list of these pointers that are of your choosing, probably in the sequence that is uh, from most viable to least viable for you. Uh, for the typical user. Same goes with uh, reference integrity measurements. That is a subset of the appraisal policies the uh, REDS architecture is talking about. Um, if you know what software components should be installed on your device on shipping, or maybe even later on after updates, then the same endorser that uh, creates these updates can provide you with reference measurements about these. So you can check uh, if these are okay. These are apparently created over time again and again because updates are created over time. And therefore you have, find, you have to find new ones again via the MAT file provided uh, by the endorser. Uh, an example given a supply chain entity. And uh, at the very end, we could even go so far and to provide uh, verifier services like uh, I'm calling here remote appraisal services here um, that are pro um, well, um, hosted by the endorser or by another supply chain entity or the distributor or the end seller or something like that. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated because if it's the end seller, then it would be not be the original dev ID, but an L dev ID created by that entity also can include a MAT URL. So it would be possible to take that also into account. Um, this seemed quite forward and easy, and therefore we wrote that. Thanks with, uh, to Elliot here, because he wrote the initial MAT file. Without that, I wouldn't really know how to use that in the in the very very kickstarting moment here, so uh, uh, he is aware of this document and the, the actual activities and uh, yeah let's uh, try this out. By I, in the last two days, I already got emails about this and we have a few, a few more uh, sets of interesting things here next to these three. But we will start with three and add further uh, vital information that are interesting and in play if uh, there's consensus. And uh, we hope that this will be an interesting draft for most of you. Okay, so we have Ned Smith in the queue, and uh, so, yeah, so Ned, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, so it, it seems to me like this is a file, and so there's, I think there's sort of a chicken and egg kind of question that I have, which is, is this, do you need a service that points you to the MUD file, uh, in which case you then pointed at either some actual documents or you're pointed to uh, an, a, another service, which in this case is an appraisal service, <clears throat> as the verifier, I'm curious to know who hosts the MUD file in terms of our canonical uh, architecture. Uh, and that's question one. And question two is, uh, would it make more sense for rats to be 
focusing on uh, in terms of discovery, would it make sense to have a discovery um, capability that uh, goes along the lines of if you're an endorser, then uh, use you know this this discovery mechanism to identify the uh, endorser those those providing endorsement services and can then host, for example, endorsement documents or reference integrity measurements, which I think are also endorsement documents as well. Um, and then and then that, that seems more appropriate. Uh, uh, then you could also talk about appraisal services as let me discover those uh, verifiers that are providing verifier services or let me discover uh, uh, other entities that are providing um, whatever service is needed to to uh, make the uh, the architecture uh, you know um, you know to discover who's providing what service in this architecture. I'm, I'm a little confused by this idea of it being a file. Um, yeah, it is. So first, there are multiple questions in here, of course. So uh, uh, I will I will take uh, the middle one first. So yeah, it's a file, yes. And the file is not the thing itself, it's a list of referrals. You have to retrieve the file, then select an appropriate URL from there and get the actual file from that resource. That's the basic idea. Uh, we have to do some frosting here. Probably uh, we need some uh, content type and, and um, encoding information that goes next to it so that you can make an informed decision you probably don't want to have the XML reference measurement that might be a little bit big uh, and, and such. So that, there's that. Then the MUD file itself has to be maintained most likely. You can have also with partners or contractors or other entities you cooperate with, but the uh, uh, entity in charge is the signer of the dev ID. Um, because that entity put the URL in there. It could outsource that, uh, of course, so it doesn't necessarily have to, to be, but that is an, on the authority of the signer. So the signer points to something, and maybe it's a, a service hosted by the signer entity or another uh, entity that is uh, in charge. And then uh, this is not supposed to be the one solution that beats them all. It is just a super simple lightweight MUD solution. So if you have nothing, if you don't have a global discovery service, which is hard and very costly, uh, you can have this. So discovery services also, there are a lot of them. There are local discovery services, there are trampolining, staggering, or there are call home features in multiple flavors. And uh, all of them tend to be more or less viable in some scenarios. And uh, that is fine. Of course, you don't have to do, use the uh, MUD file for reds but it is a very simple, straightforward solution that is well, actually easy to deploy. So the intended usage is something provisions a MUD file on some entity, re regardless of what role it's playing. And <clears throat> if provisioned, then that entity can read the file to identify um, you know, where it can go for uh, resources and services. I think per the definition of the architecture, by providing the MUD file, it would become a very tiny endorser already uh, because MUD files can be signed. There can be a, a pointer to a CMS encoded uh, a signature of the MUD file. That signature has to come from someone, probably the signer of the dev ID. That would make very much sense. And um, so, yeah, I, I would agree with that, uh, adding, adding my, my comments to that. Okay, so if we can move on to Dave's question, we are running behind, so I'm going to try to see what we can do to make up some time. Okay, Dave Taylor, um, comment and question that are separate things. Comment, uh, the term, uh, I would recommend aligning with the terms that, were, that we have in the architecture document. In other words, I would recommend replacing reference integrity measurements with reference values because some of the reference values are not measurements. Um, hopefully we can ag agree on that one. Otherwise we can take it offline into the architecture document discussion. Um, but I want to get to my question and my question is fine. If you want to answer it in the next version of the document, as opposed to taking up time here, the question is, uh, I know this is draft zero zero. The security consideration section is, uh, largely vacant right now. Um, yes. and so I think the key question here, by the way, I, I think that this notion of using the mud file to get information like this is useful. So thank you for starting on this. 
Um, but the question is, how do you know that you're getting the correct MUD file from the correct location with the correct content, right? Because that's where your security comes down to new, especially since like the bottom point on here is about how you might learn a verifier service, right? If you can replace that with an attacker's version of a verifier service, then you can do yeah. all kinds of nasty things, right? And so it's really, how do I know that I'm getting the correct MUD file from the correct place? And that one requires more discussion. And so please let's put that into your next version of the document and to answer it there. So I think that's the key question. Very well noted. Uh, you're absolutely right. No, on the list. It actually mostly is on the list, but you phrased it very uh, concisely. Okay. Um, if that was the end of the queue, uh, moving on to measurements. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, yeah, um, working on the mud, uh, the mud rats file, um, rats mud file. That's a correct way. Um, the uh, we always anticipated or planned to do uh, reference integrity measurements, or effectively, they are a ref the reference values for software components or parts of the software components. Um, and uh, we want to do this with CoSwit, which was uh, um, is, is being finished in uh, uh, so RFC. Soon we go to uh, we, are, we are working last call in SECM right now. Uh, and I think on Friday there's the next second meeting. Um, Sorry, I just meant uh, that Lawrence's comment. Um, so we uh, add to that. Uh, CoSwit is literally littered with extension points by uh, on purpose uh, because we uh, anticipated uh, RIM work on this. Uh, back in the days, it was called RIM. Uh, I assume this in this context, this acronym is fine, but we will revisit the reference value question here as well. Um, first slide, please. So. What we do here is we take the original uh, data definition of uh, CoSuite and uh, use certain extension points to add, for the moment, in this draft, two schemes, so to speak, uh, how to uh, model uh, reference integrity measurements. I'm just keeping with this term in this scope of the, of the presentations right now. Sorry, Dave. Um, so one of them is HIRS, uh, I think, um, which is done by uh, NSA and, and DOD. So uh, there is um, an ongoing, the link is here, there's an ongoing software development that is uh, based on a TCG uh, specification. Uh, also highlighted here, the public version is, I think, available still. Um, and there will be a published stuff very soon, uh, published document very soon. Um, this is, uh, basically adding certain elements to uh, evidence and uh, then uh, have the exact uh, counterpart and identification of counterpart in this RIM format so that you can match them easily and find them easily. And there is basically, it's basically metadata for the reference values that you require. Um, that is well thought out. It is more about the uh, runtime and startup, as you can see. Um, uh, runtime is a, a tad bit more difficult than startup. Most of the items in the list today are about startup, but I would recommend to read uh, the corresponding uh, TCV specification for the moment. We will uh, draw in more expositional text soon. Then we were very happy to uh, have uh, Patrick with us as a co-author. Uh, he provided a very small and light weighted uh, scheme for RPM versions coming from Red Hat. Uh, basically practically using in other distributions and mappable to other um, packaging formats as well. And uh, while we are, uh, well, I was writing this, these slides, there was another um, uh, request to add another scheme for the layered attestation and it is done in, uh, in the, uh, um, or is how it's uh, described in the uh, REDS architecture recently. That is, um, uh, working out uh, interesting because sometimes switches are not anticipating stuff without file systems or multi-entity signed uh, things, and that is the thing with layer utilization. You layer multiple components from different vendors. I want to have a if, if they're very tightly coupled and basically not separable, maybe signed by one final entity. So we are figuring out how that works, and that's very interesting work right now. 
And adding to that, uh, while I was uh, preparing this speak, uh, this presentation here, uh, there is a fourth uh, interested party now incoming, uh, providing us with how uh, Linux-based systems and firmware-based systems would work uh, in the realm of network equipment. And that is also very welcome. So expect way more content soon. This is a zero zero draft. And uh, please uh, try to uh, look at it. Uh, the CDDL is complete, but the description of the CDDL is still lacking. Uh, again, this is a zero zero to, to find people who are interested and this works very well right now. Looking at the Q and Lawrence's comment. Ah, I see, so that's a comment. So there's no Q. Are there any questions live? Otherwise, I, this is uh, just a report. And uh, my recommendation is if you're interested in uh, doing the whole circle here, uh, this is an interesting uh, document to maybe latch on. Uh, CoSwit will also be, or is effectively also used in the um, NIST NIST uh, effort that is SCAP, the Security Content Automation Protocol version 2.0. It's replacing the CPE concept there. Okay, moving on to endorsement eat. Um, yeah, this is basically self-explaining. Again, MUD file points to endorsements. Uh, we need some endorsements to find out how this works that are not uh, located in the root of trust itself. So we are basically uh, stealing from other specifications uh, claims that are interesting, we think, to describe uh, the things that cannot create evidence by their own. Uh, today, uh, these endorsements are provided by the endorsers of the root of trusts. Um, I could highlight that uh, there are only, I think, six of these new claims that we define for the endorsement flavor of each, which are basically uh, uh, a, um, a more loose definition of the OM, OEM ID in EAT, which we call a component manufacturer. Uh, a OM ID has a very well known and relatively conflict free definition because you're using uh, subsections of uh, the uh, um, hardware identifiers. Um, this here is, to be honest, a text string, but it is used uh, in two different solutions, basically. And therefore, we thought maybe a uh, lightweight component manufacturer identifier is also uh, okay. Same goes with version um, and model. These are typically used to uh, identify a hardware component uniquely. And then we have some characteristics already included, like is, is the root of trust actually uh, mutable or not mutable? Probably in a testing environment also can be uh, quite mutable if it's in a TEE. So is it field upgradable or not? Uh, how uh, is the uh, secret created that uh, then is stored in the um, uh, testing environment to sign evidence, for example. So sometimes you have, have um, hardware like, like, like puffs that fall into place when, when being used, or you have uh, uh, a, a random generator, a number generator that is, has high entropy and therefore uh, can, can generate a secret that you actually never see, can only operate on in the uh, um, a testing environment itself, or is it uh, imprinted from the outside? So this is an origination claim. Where does the secret effectively come from? And who knows it, therefore? And uh, in the end, um, we have a, a common criteria. Sometimes things are already certified. And you probably want to know which specific criteria document uh, includes that uh, um, uh, certification. So you can look it up and check that. Uh, so these are first candidates. I think uh, most likely more. These are already relatively well defined and would be another set of uh, uh, EAT claims that would go into the endorsement flavor for EAT. Um, having said that, it's not on the slide here. Uh, I assume, and I think Lawrence is inclined to agree that we will have to put specific claims into EAT that specializes them, like an evidence EAT, an endorsement EAT, or in attestation, uh, attestation result each, for example. Um, but Lawrence might have a comment on that. So basically, I'm addressing him here by doing the presentation. Um, so we can uh, better understand what the purpose of the EAT is, uh, not having to skim through all the claims, find a unique one for, for, for say, uh, endorsement here, and then, oh, I know, finally, this is an endorsement. And maybe then it's, again, not. I don't know. Maybe you can reuse these claims later on. So that is my report on this zero zero draft. 
that is uh, uh, well only an incubator. And Lawrence, thank you to Q. <laughs> Nets first. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, so, yeah. so my, my question was, is there a bright line difference between a quote endorsement claim and a quote eat claim? Or are we just, are we really talking about claims in general and some of which could be uh, uh, included in endorsements, some could be included in evidence and what, what makes sense, <clears throat> maybe what we need to be talking about is <clears throat> what sets of what sets of claims are appropriate for an endorser to make versus those that are appropriate for an attester to make, <clears throat> and why? And uh, and and uh, uh, next, uh, that's sort of question one, <clears throat> which is maybe a little bit rhetorical. Uh, question two is around um, <clears throat> whether or not there's a difference between a claim included in, say, uh, a COSWID um, uh, um, encoding versus uh, something that's a EAT encoding. I'm, I'm just, the uh, question is around encoding and does encoding matter in this conversation? Um, encoding matters in so far, I mean, I'm going from, from back to end now, sorry. Encoding matters in so far that, um, we are uh, basically working with it actually here in order to create a document that you can discover at some point. So we want to have uh, early solution for, for fast prototyping and it is very convenient for that. So uh, at the moment, this draft is relatively it specific, but as uh, Lawrence, how Lawrence created the e-draft or how it was molded over time, it uses CDDL for information and definition. This uh, is also done here and therefore we can have the information model semantics also. You can derive other encodings from that. Uh, this goes hand in hand as it does with EAT. For the application of the new claims, are they valid for um, claims for evidence? Maybe. Um, I am not sure if a root of trust create evidence. Therefore, I assume this is an endorsement claim because it just cannot be evidenced. That's the whole point. And because a root of trust cannot create evidence about itself or a corresponding, let's call it, uh, it's referred to the, the more general term, the attesting environment cannot create evidence about itself, only about the target environment. And therefore I would assume, no, these claims could be used in evidence, but then the semantics change. And then I think they're not the same claims anymore because it is literally <laughs> about these things I think that there are corner cases where, for example, an attesting environment could observe uh, a target environment where, for example, a debug state is a full permanent disable state uh, and report that as evidence. Uh, it's also reasonable that a uh, endorser could say, I manufactured this device with the full permanent debug disable property. And so uh, regardless of whether you're a root of trust or some layer somewhere else or some other component, their, you know, their debug uh, feature is disabled. Both, uh, I, you know, there's an argument for, for saying both, both uh, are meaningful. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, that is a very good point. I was only talking about the applicability of these claims and evidence. Yes. I think some of the evidence are applicable here. Because you basically are providing ex evidence that's vouched from the outside for the attesting environment. So, what about the attesting environment? And therefore, yes, I think evidence claim could be include could become endorsement claims in this uh, direction. That would work, I assume. So, uh, um, yeah. I, I think it is hard to draw a bright line between endorsement claims and evidence claims. Um, and even further, um, what shows up in attestation results, which could be a merger of the uh, endorsement claims and evidence claims. Um, my only real comment here is to is that I think there's a, a fair bit of work to do to sort of figure out the model here and how they sit together. And and um, I, and I, I'm not sure we can draw a, a, a bright line. <clears throat> Here, so this is, seems like a, a good start, but I feel like there's some work to do here. Um, 
then I, I wanted to just on the comment on Coastwood, um, um, my sense is that Coastwood is going to be uh, sort of a subclaim in EAT. So, uh, I mean, you know, Hank has proposed that, and I, I think that's generally a good idea. So, that was an answer to uh, Ned's second question. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes. So, to uh, follow up to Lawrence's uh, statement, uh, if we're talking about reference, uh, you know, endorsement of values, then is it possible to have an endorsement assertion that is that is you know begins with with Coastwood and may may not be wrapped by EAT. Uh, and, and that, that maybe is a, is also maybe a, a sub, sub part of that question is uh, uh, do we rely on something like mud to be the starting point of how the different structures can be uh, you know work, identify where you, where to start I, I think I think that's a general question of where to start um, and I don't know that that the answer for where to start in evidence is the same as the answer for where to start in endorsement. Yeah, so in the interest of brevity, I'm going to just express my own opinion too, but no hat on, which I think Ned had no hat on either. Um, so I think we'll wind up needing both these uh, SWID combination in an eight plus use the use of the extension. And there's gonna be different use cases and implementations that dictate what's what's best. And I think next in queue is um, Jerry. Uh, hi, <clears throat> I hope you can hear me. Um, I guess you know, why I understood endorsements from the architecture document, and I'm going to admit that I, that I may misunderstand it, I would have thought at least there would be certain manufacturers who are already able to support endorsements via 509 chains. And if that's the case, I don't even think you would need an eat to convey that. I think you can. I think you can just take codes as is with the five, with the um, standards track 509 extension uh, extension um, spec, um, specification and progress, and uh, and just use that as is. Um, if that's the case, I mean, do, I mean, do you? For, um, well, actually, I should ask the author, Hank. Do you agree? And if not, what would be the advantages? Of conveying just a 509 chain in an ETH format versus just as a code, say, uh, just as code, say. Oh. We were actually thinking about using concise identities, which is basically an X509 expressed in native CWT with a cozy container around it, and having a, a very, like, let's call it a fresh restart for the things once upon a time called extensions, then their claims or claim sets. Um, we were thinking about that, and this still might go that lane. Uh, I am not vetted, um, basically married to, uh, to, to eat here. Uh, I think it is, first of all, convenient for, uh, let's call it, it's, it's not mandatory to implement it in our domain here, but eat, I mean, it's a CW2, it's very easy to compose, and it's very easy to parse. And there is a lot of benefit to using the registry. So that is my was my first take at it. Um, yes, you could make it a, a pub key certificate, and therefore a concise identity, or even the old school X509 thing. Um, both are possible. We don't know if these semantics are really required here. Um, again, it would be in theory an attribute certificate that then has an holder. Uh, that is the pub key certificate because these are attributes. This is not an identity document. And if you want to do it right, it should be a, first of all an X509 pub key, but an X509 attribute certificate, uh, which again creates overhead. Uh, and you need, need a PKI, uh, which you probably need in any case if you uh, want to uh, validate the signatures via certification paths. So, yes, there is similar infrastructure required, we assume, and that is most likely. Uh, there is no good answer yet. This is a zero zero draft and we will first try to draw that demarcation line that bright, bright that line that we don't know if it really exists or maybe just highlight with each claim. This is used for endorsement never used as an evidence or all of these evidence claims are also interesting. So having a little bit of mapping might be interesting. 
Um, we don't know the best way yet, but if you have a, please monitor this draft accordingly, this would be my advice today, and contribute early on so we can do it right. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay. Another one in the queue, I'm checking. So, um, yeah, if that's the last, yeah, okay. Then we can uh, switch to the final one. Sorry for my monologue today. It's really a blob. So the document is called Hanks Blob, I think. Um, yeah, this is a um, relatively new draft. It's called the Unprotected CW Claims Sets. We had a lot of discussions, I think, and some, some of them very fruitful uh, about how and when it is okay to convey something that is an eat, but not signed, which is a problem because a CWG must be signed. There is no way around it. Otherwise, it's not a CWT. There was a lot of uh, uh, discussion around this. Just a small recap, like revisiting CWT and make that uh, work uh, so we don't have to take care of it. Uh, and then uh, there were other um, ideas floated. Um, this is probably about the CBOR realm I have to highlight. Uh, but we are using CDDA. In theory, it could be uh, con um, somehow, at somehow, way, I don't know, permutated somehow to, 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 to JSON. Um, why do we want to uh, sign something and how, how do we solve it? So going to the first slide, please. Uh, this draft defines a CBOR tag for the very defined term CWT claims set. There is where this clunky acronym comes from. Um, it's defined in CWT. And it's basically, it's, it's the content that is then the map uh, with the claims in it that is then wrapped by the cozy container. And this map has a specific tag and then goes into a, yeah, well, cozy. And then it's time. And uh, so we did, I think, the effort approach that, is, that provides the most synergy with existing parsers. Um, that is, we just created a second tag for this map. And if the second tag is found in front of the map, you don't expect a cozy envelope around it. And uh, then we had to talk about when is this okay? Because just conveying something about a signature is like idiocy if you don't have a so-called secure channel in place and now the title kicks in um this secure channel somehow and there's some certain prerequisites uh requirements and, and environmental factors has to be as good as the signature we just omitted and if that is the case uh it is okay to convey this claim set um there is ongoing work and that is why there is jeremy on this um, presentation uh, uh here uh, who will become a co-author in 01. Uh, there is work in global platform that has uh, that is specifying uh, exactly that. Uh, in the world of global platform, sometimes an EAT don't have to be signed. It's, it's a very CPU intensive, it's overhead, and you, you, you if, if the surrounding channel is good enough works. So, so this text now has to grow, and it's currently growing very much, but it's not visible in the zero zero, about the discussion of these characteristics, these, these, these situations when it is okay. And uh, while we, uh, I was preparing again this slide, I got more, for, more feedback than from the, than the, the four people here on the roster already included here uh, about how to uh, maybe convey other items. And so uh, if this proves to be valid, we will include it and pull that in. But at the moment, the discussion we would like to spark is uh, when is it okay? We will provide an update, I hope relatively soon. We have a next uh, design meeting on Monday uh, with the authors and then uh, uh, can give you more food for discussion. But uh, um, I think this was uh, deemed to be necessary. It's basically a reach out to global platform to address their uh, um, corner case. Now, maybe it's not even a corner case. Maybe it's a prominent case, actually. But uh, that was prohibited to be addressed here in ITF right now because CBDOG had to or must be signed and therefore there was no way forward. And yeah, basically this is more on the report edge and why we do this. And uh, please monitor the discussion about secure channel, basically the improvement of text about secure channel in the corresponding draft. 
and view. Uh, yeah. So, is the scope of this really to is it is it narrowly scoped to address the global platform usage scenarios where you know the some some use case involves a secure channel or is it more broadly scoped to identify all the places where an unsigned set of claims, for example, the reason for UCCS, might fit in, a, in any kind of conveyance, whether it's a certificate or a signed EAT or a signed uh, COSWID or a signed something else, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what would you say is the scope of this, the intended scope of this? The scope is intended to address all conveyance methods, even secured bus locally, not even using internet protocol. That would be a secure channel by definition, we assume, if there are uh, correct endorsements in place that say, yeah, this is the case, for example. Or you can create evidence beforehand and then start something. Um, or if, a, uh, if TLS is set up appropriately, you can even, even do, uh, um, if, if some authentication has taken place, and therefore some security guarantees can be uh, uh, phrased that might also be already starting to allow for uh, your UCCS. So yes, I, the quick answer, our current thinking is we assume the secure channel to be manifold. Okay. To be, I want to cover a lot of this discussion here. So, so, so second vector for scoping is, is it specific to UCCS, <clears throat> which is an unsigned you know, token, uh, or does it also include unsigned COSWID and unsigned, you know, something else, whatever is, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever other thing we determine is appropriate, uh, you know, structure for capturing claims. <clears throat> there can be an unsigned version of whatever that is and is, are those other things considered in scope for this draft as well? Um, well, unsigned codes are already allowed because codes can have different natures. For example, they can be evidence, literally defined by ISO that way. And therefore, if you are creating as an attesting environment this code with as a as, as a uh, report about uh, like like claims, a very very specific claim as as, as Lawrence highlighted um, about software components, then it is enough to sign the EAT, and you don't have to also sign. The code split is just redundant signing if you have the same sign up. There might be use to having a separate signature, of course, but uh, it is not required, and code allows for unsigned code split. So, um, sorry, the rest of the other question was? Uh, it was just scoping in terms of uh, it, it, whatever this group determines is, the, is a, a reasonable uh, way to express claims. Uh, there can be an unsigned representation of that. And so it sounded like you were, I think your answer was, yeah, it, it includes uh, it, pretty much anything that this group determines as a way to express a claim. Yeah, I, the, the, the things that are going into UCCS are using the same registry as EAT. I think that speaks for itself somehow. Right, and, and uh, even, though, even though the title is UCCS, it also extends to COSWID? Uh, now, COSWIT has a separate definition of being unsigned. It's also not an a, 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 a EAT uh, or, or a signed CWT for that manner. So, um, um, yeah, it, it's a little bit different. It uses a very similar structure, which is not surprising because it's using maps in CBOR. And so, 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 in terms of the motivation for doing this, which is the um, you know, use cases, usage scenarios, um, where there is the need for some, some unsigned something or other because there, some other layer is signing it. <clears throat> it seems like that's, that's a broader, that's sort of a rather broad topic. And uh, if this, if the, the, the goal of this is to, to um, you know, capture, you know, how, uh, how to address that, then it seems like it would be appropriate to not have it be focused on use, just UCCS, right? Yeah, yeah. That, is, that is true. Uh, there is, for example, a topic we are, we are discussing currently that is 
the meaning of signature. So what does it mean if uh, three UCCSs are nested in an EAT and then it's signed? Does this signature imply meaning to the UCSS or do they have to bring their own meaning in form of claims? Why do we trust the unsigned portion? Is it from a part of the device or what? what so what, what, what does all this mean? Uh, what, what do I gather? What information do I gleam by, by having an unsigned CSS nested in an EAT? What does, what does it make this? Uh, uh, what is what is the expression of this? And we have to uh, include uh, text about that most certainly. Uh, this is was brought, brought up by Global Platform as a, we should probably do this. Agree. So I, I have a couple of comments and questions on scope here. Um, First of all, I mean, this discussion that you're having, I'm not sure where it is. It seems like it should be on the rats mailing list um, because at least I'm not seeing it. Um, it seems like it's generic, but, but maybe even it should be on the ACE mailing list because I believe this draft is applicable to all of CWT. So even the, the original CWT use cases would um, be involved here. So, because you, you're just saying, unsigned CWTs, you're not signed, saying unsigned EATs. Um, so this would apply to any use of CWT, right? And let's say we come up with another use of CWT called drink, or we have another use of CWT for you know replacing X509 servers or something like that. This draft would apply to CWT no matter what the context is, which doesn't that put it over, push it over to the ACE working group? Yeah, excellent point. So you're absolutely right. The zero zero draft is uh, eat agnostic. It is CWT specific. I think that's um, the right thing to do. But yeah, and I and and, and I want, we, are, we are just testing if you can keep that up. If you're going into the segmentic of nested eats of evidence and uh, how this works together, how we how we can describe the usage. So we will, we will most certainly try uh, and we will have the discussion uh, open, of course, but we want to have a good basis for the discussion to have all the, the stubs in and, and not to, not to, I don't know, meandering around on, on only a very specific subset. Um, so we will really try to do the O1 fast and, and we are, that's our target. And then we will um, find out if we can keep it uh, eat agnostic. If we can do that, then yes, I, I, th there is a possibility this will go to ACE. So the confusion. Jim, Jim has an opinion about this. Sorry. Then, then there's the there. You know, if you're if you're putting unsigned UCCSs inside CWTs or nesting them, it sounds like that's sounds almost like a submodule in EAT. Yes. You have so, this nested no. claim sets the submodules. Yes. Yeah, so I think we, I mean, I think that discussion should be in the eat rats context and I'm sure where you're, where you're having it, but I think it needs to come up to the rats context for, so the folks that are looking at eat submodules can see it too. Mm -hmm. I, 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 my assumption is that we need claims that, that uh, annotate this, a few maybe probably residing in the statement or so, so the, 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 the map itself being eat or UCCS, but I don't, we don't know yet. Also, I, I most certainly don't know yet. Um, we have uh, assumptions, <laughs> that's all. And uh, yeah, I think uh, to order to, to uh, find out if this is ACE uh, material, we have to put all the stuff in that is, might also be a little bit rats agnostic and then massage maybe the rats out of the content to make it ACE. If that is possible, it could go to ACE and be more generic. And then the uh, uh, definition it would even make more sense because uh, it's not a REDS document anymore. Um, can, can you uh, answer the comment uh, or about um, where this discussion is happening and how we can get the, the EAT folks involved in the discussion? Um, the discussion is basically author discussion at the moment um, because we want to provide you with the uh, best starting point. Um, we had this draft created uh, to, uh, to start, kick start the discussion with, with Global Platform. And now as we consolidated that, I think we should go uh, with, with online discussion very, very soon. Um, maybe not necessarily starting with ACE, but, but considering 
the ace lane later on. And we have to have the options for secure channels a little more, um, um, with, with a little more meat on the bones. So there's, there's, there's not really much meat on that domain at the moment. So we want to provide at least uh, four user scenarios, uh, which we're currently working on. This should be finished in one or two weeks. We will submit these one zero, and then we can have a full-fledged discussion on this, if that is okay with you. Um, uh, going on with the, with the uh, sausage making text right now is probably not very useful. We have to bring it into a readable order now. Uh, that has not, uh, has not happened yet. Okay. Is that good enough for you? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, Ned, again, I think the, the conversation needs to be held more broadly. And uh, I think there's a big difference between what your, your slides say, uh, providing a high level of assurance versus what the intended goal of the RATS uh, roles architecture, which is to describe who is, is saying what, what assertions are, are being claimed by the entity that is, that is asserting them. And the, the notion of a digital signature uh, around claims uh, I think the intent of the architecture is that it's trying to capture this notion of this entity, you know, this role, role slash entity is making these assertions, which is different from there is a, there is a, you know, a, 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 uh, a key that is providing some, some level of integrity protection. Those are different things and uh, that needs to really be teased out in this, uh, 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 I would be, I, I think it's gonna, it, it's gonna go the wrong direction if, if uh, it tries to equate the two. Absolutely agree. We are trying to, uh, the, the, the uh, let's call it usage scenarios where this is okay, where the secure channel is as good as the signature, they might be vastly different. Uh, we assume that uh, there is more than we know, and we want to just have a, a polished set of, of starting points, and then we can add to that uh, everything that is viable and accepted by this group, most certainly. And we will not just uh, equate these conditions. There might be very different ways to come to the conclusion, yes, it is as good as. I mean, one another path here might just be to define UCCS as basically just define the tag, not try to discuss all of the security stuff and have a very big, ugly security consideration section that says, if you use this without security, you know, you're dumb or something, or be sure you use security with this. It might, because the, because the, the security might be very context specific to, you know, a lot of different contexts and it might be impossible to cover in one draft. Working we, we, we might not be able to be exhaustive, but uh, we, we, this is basically was, was the main discussion that, that, that uh, we had before uh, uh, moving on with this. Um, how much do we have to talk about the secure channel? And uh, at least the, the four individuals that are the authors agree a lot. Um, it is really important to provide guidance here uh, none, because uh, otherwise it's very unresponsible to let UCCS go wild. I mean, apparently it's dumb. Sorry, just to do it. And I don't know, TCP, apparently. Maybe even with HTTPS, it's probably never okay. Just, just doing it. So there has to be the right set of, of uh, prerequisites. And, and I think it is vital to highlight that you cannot use this just at your leisure. It, it is obvious to most, but to some it might not. And therefore we need more expositional text on this. And there has to be security considerations. Otherwise this could be dangerous. I think it's my Hank's opinion. Please speak up if I'm uh, doing hyperbole uh, <laughs> or grandization here, but I think it's a required. Uh, no, just, <clears throat> You said it earlier, we need to be clear about what the semantics of signing means, or in the context of a, of a higher level protocol, the, the, what are the semantics of inclusion of 
claims in the payload for a protocol, you know, what's what are the semantics that should be attributed to that action? And there's uh, an, uh, I think, an AD on the line. Oh, a lot of people. Oh, go. Okay. Well, I don't know where the queue is. Ferris, please help me. Karsten, Karsten and Roman. Yeah, I just wanted to, to quickly make the observation that this is really two documents in one. Uh, one is uh, the definition of UCCS, which is almost trivial. And the other one is the security considerations that go with the use of UCCS in RADS. Um, now, uh, there should maybe be a third part, which is the simple statement. If you want to use UCCS somewhere else, uh, provide security considerations. Lauren seems to agree. And, uh, wants to respond to Karsten's comment. I think it's a comment to the comment. Okay, uh, Lawrence, you're on. Otherwise, Roman. I just was agreeing. That's all. Okay. I think. Plus one. Okay, uh, uh, Roman. Yeah, I mean, my comment on something like this would be. In addition to security considerations, I would be interested in seeing strong normative language and an applicability statement about where this could and could not be used. Yeah, having the anti uh, statement like like uh, in scope and most certainly out of scope is a very good directive. Yeah. If that is the last comment, we actually have a few minutes to wrap this up. For Ned, I think the last chair on the call. Uh, nope, I joined back a while ago. Hi, Kathleen. Hi. I've been back <laughs> on for an hour. <laughs> so, yep, so if that's it, I, I don't have any closing comments. Um, do our ADs or Ned have any? My only feedback was I'm super excited about all the directions that the work is taking. What's not necessarily apparent to me, because again, there's there's a lot to, to kind of review here is how many distinct documents we're talking about. I don't fully understand kind of the merging of some of the documents we're talking and I know the working group needs to decide that. Uh, I would just advise as we're thinking about all of this, just to, to double check with the scoping on the charter text to make sure we're, we're kind of staying inside what we said we would do and if we need to go a little further, uh, we have a conversation about recharter. Oh, absolutely. Yes, we only have a few documents that have been adopted. Very, very few. So um, that will all be kept in mind, not to worry. Yeah, thanks. I saw all the enthusiasm about the unadopted documents before making that comment. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to echo a similar concern about uh, charter scope. Right, so we just factor that into any decisions in terms of what we adopt. Um, new work presented doesn't necessarily mean it will be adopted. This is this is a really hot area at the moment in industry, so we're bound to see lots of different proposals, whether or not we can take them on. Right, so even there was a um, a BOF session that touched with some overlap, so it, it's a hot area. Thank you. Sorry, all. Kathleen. Uh, what, so what, what buff were you referring to? Attestation in general. It's a hot area. Oh, the buff? I don't remember. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. There was like two buffs for security. It was one of them. And it was more okay. of like a transport that could be applicable. I don't know if Ben or Roman remembers the name. I, I'm sure one of you remembers it. Or maybe not. <laughs> I will look it up. Thanks. We had a TX off buff last time, but that's you know only slightly overlapping with the topics at hand here. Uh, maybe it wasn't. To me. Maybe it wasn't that. Maybe it was in a different area. Um, it was.
is the mask buff. Thank you. Point being just that it's a, it's a hot area, and so we will watch scope. I'll have to drop. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Bye.